get the yeah, just share course. the screen. So let's share the screen. That's it. You start the screen. That's it. There we are. Um, get rid of this lot here. But um, if you need to, I've got to say, I'll just let me talk over you for a second. If if people need to hide the gallery on the right because it's overlapping the slides, if you go to the top, you'll see view options, and then you can hide video panel. Just hide the video. That'll hide the gallery while we're watching the display. Right, carry on, Andrew. Sorry. Okay, well, um, some of you know that I collect a wide range of uh, stamps, as well as doing a little bit of postal history, although I'm pretty much a beginner at that. And uh, recently, the French were celebrating the art of printing and 50 years of printing at their uh, factory in uh, Boulazac. So last year in uh, the summer, they produced a very beautiful miniature sheet based on a, a previous stamp, which shows uh, at the bottom a young lady with all the tools of the engraver's trade. And um, this was produced on the basis of a stamp from 1984. And you can see the very attractive young lady with all her tools uh, available. It was quite an expensive um, set of stamps in that each one is four euros. But curiously, whilst there are 8 million of the original stamps, there are only 400,000 of the, uh, sorry, 40,000 of the miniature sheets produced uh, in 2020, which is probably an indication of, if you look at the um, print rates of stamps over the last 10 or 15 years, they're gradually going down all the time. Then on the 4th of November, they uh, intimated that they were going to produce a new stamp, again, based on previous one, which was to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the new printing press. And um, the rest of the talk is all going to be about the booklet, which they then issued uh, in a few minutes. But quite unexpectedly, they then went over to produce a complete sheet of the new Marianne stamps with this overprint 50 years of Bras dans l'histoire, um, with all these um, many different um, bits of text in the side celebrating the different um, types of stamps which have been produced over the years um, under the heading of Marianne. So those have just fairly recently come uh, on the market and uh, are available now. Um, there are stamps for the second class ordinary post uh, equivalent uh, in France. But then they produced this very beautiful prestige booklet. Um, and uh, I'm going to go through how this is put together and what it is. It won't take terribly long, but um, it is an interesting booklet. Um, <laughs> there are some very interesting things about the way it's been designed, which I'll try and pick up on, on the way through. So the first page is essentially a white car. It's a cardboard outside with an embossed 50 years of uh, um, on the front, a hole which shows the part of the, the first sheet and a very thick and very heavily glued um, left hand edge to hold it all together. This is the first page which you were seeing through the hole in the cover, followed by um, an introductory page commenting on the fact that the printing had been moved in 1970 from Paris to the new plant, uh, Boulezac, which was said to um, combine all the um, <coughs> experience that there had been um, previously in printing French stamps. And the next sheet really, again, is more about the history and um, about the fact that um, it included all the different uh, techniques of printing on the new site. Oops, sorry. And then I probably I should comment about what the rest of it's about because the layout of the rest of the booklet is a sheet of um, semi-transparent, almost tissue paper with a design over a further sheet. So for what you see is when you open up, this is one of the semi-transparent sheets with a description of what's underneath it. And it's quite confusing because that's how it actually appears when you open the booklet. So um, for this page, you can actually read 
the, the text at the bottom, but you'll see later on that for a number of them, when you open up, you can't actually read the text. And I don't think it's a particularly clever design, really. So when you open it up, you get the back side of the, um, the semi-transparent sheet on the left and the new stamps um, on the right, which are uh, 1 euro 16. The original stamp back in 1970, um, so this is the, the new stamp, and these are the original ones from 1970, um, showing the arrangement of the stamps and the labels on the sheet. But then for the rest of it, it's all about the knowledge of how stamps and how printing is done. And it describes um, the advantages, the different printing types, the, the fact that you have to use um, different inks to produce the end result. Most of you will know all of this already, so I'm not going to go through the text in any detail. So the next sheet would appear like that when you open it up. And as you can see, the bottom, uh, second bottom line is really almost impossible to read like that, which is a pity really. Um, but that's what the sheet says. And when you open it up, you get the new stamps, which are uh, 97 cents. And of course, this is the Braille stamp, which was um, produced originally in 1989. So the originals are on the right, um, which I've added in. Um, and in the booklet, you've got the new stamps. Then it goes on to talk about the uh, photogravure process or heliogravure, depending on what you like to call it. And another sheet slightly confusing again with the over the overlay um, which is of General de Gaulle's head and the cross of Lorraine and um, those are the stamps the new stamps and the original one on the right from 1977 and on this occasion <laughs> the 50 has been put onto the the actual page with the stamps so rather than having that as the overlay page they've included that in the page that they've printed the stamps on um, then they talk about the mix process of mixing um, uh, engraved stamps and uh, offset stamps. And they use as an example of this um, the centenary of the public works school stamps. And so that, that's the overlay sheet. They, these are the new stamps of 116 euros and the original from 1991 of, of two. 50 for comparison. And then they go on to talk about um, the adhesive stamps. So once again, the, the overlay sheet with uh, Marianne de Briat or Marianne de Bicentenaire, uh, depending on how you like to call it. Um, the new stamps of 116 euros, which are actually um, represent the original booklet stamps from 1977, which were two francs 30 each. And then they go on to talk about special stamps. Once again, the same kind of idea, the cover sheet with the description and four of the, the stamps, the World Cup stamps from 1998. And rather confusingly, the dates um, haven't been changed on a lot of these stamps. So even if you, uh, <laughs> it, it would be quite easy to pass one of the old ones off as one of the new ones on, on a letter, I think, very confusing for the postman. Uh, the original um, Valentine's Day heart-shaped stamp um, and a couple of others, which I'll show you in a moment. The, um, this sort of low bar, low bar stamp was from the miniature sheet in, nine, in 2013. Um, and if I just go back, you can see that the new stamp as still retains the La Post 2013, as, as indeed does this one here. So um, they are slightly confusing and misleading in that respect. And these are the space stamps which were um, uh, issued uh, in 2015 with new values on the, uh, on the, in the booklet. And then they talk about uh, stamps with a smell or a perfume and the one they choose is the uh, are from the miniature sheet of chocolate. Now, if you if you get these stamps or the miniature sheet and you smell them, they actually smell of chocolate, believe it or not. It's a good idea to keep it away from the children just in case they eat your stamps. Really. Um, 
but it's amazing how long it lasts. And um, I've got an ori the original sheet, um, which still smells of chocolate. But they, they haven't, I think because of the format of the book, they've only included some of the stamps, which you can see uh, there are actually a two more stamps um, on the, the original miniature sheet. So it shows some uh, cocoa beans, uh, Quetzalcoatl, uh, Cortes, um, the Alhambra, um, the Bay of Bayonne. I think that is, I forget who that's Louis, one of the French kings, and I uh, can't remember who that is. Uh, a chocolate factory, a bar of chocolate, some drinking chocolate, and somebody eating chocolate. It's a rather nice little miniature sheet. And if you're on a diet and you don't want to eat the chocolate, you can always just take the miniature sheet out and sniff it instead. And lastly, they just finish off with some examples of some of the, the more modern stamps. You'll see here that the, um, the, the international stamps, uh, this the round, two round ones, both have four um, blocks on them, and the uh, letter prioritaire stamps have three blocks on them. I imagine this is to do with some new um, sorting method that they're using, uh, which I'm afraid not aware of. So that's it really. They finish off obviously with, um, with acknowledgements and copyrights. But a really nice book, quite difficult to get because there were only a few thousand of them produced. I think, it, I think uh, Richard told me there were only about 6,000 of them produced um, and um, quite expensive. So if you're interested in a bit of investment, I think probably it's as good as anything. And that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. Mm. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, if you could stop screen sharing, that would be lovely. Um, yeah, if I can work out how to do that. Probably um, be at the top. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Uh, right, there we go. At the top, it should say stop, Chris, uh, stop sharing in red, I think it is. There we are. That's it. Yeah, it's just a question of any kind of it. Yeah, that's the one bit I hadn't worked out. <laughs> with the chocolate ones, if you put them in your album, does everything else get impregnated with chocolate? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I, I mean, it may well do. I must admit, I've got mine in, in the little cellophane sort of uh, I yeah. use archive quality stuff, but it does last, yeah. Yes, one of the things. Very nice. Interesting to see those. One doesn't, these booklets, one just doesn't see them really unless you collect the modern stuff, which I don't. Interesting. Okay, and has anybody got any questions? You can all use the chat button at the bottom if you want to ask questions, and I can always read them out if you need to. Otherwise, we shall press on. Um, Roger, you're there, I believe. Yes, I've got to. <clears throat> you might have to tell me which buttons to press there. What have you lost? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. If you if, at the bottom, you should have share screen in green. Yep. So if you click on that. Yep. And that should show you your desktop. Then you just want to click on your display. That's it. You got it. Good heavens. And then just click on slideshow at the top ribbon. Yep. And click on from beginning. Yeah, click on that slideshow and then on the left from beginning that removes the thumbnails well wow. that's it that's it gosh it's, <coughs> it's something new anyway uh, this is a, a rather light-hearted display because i i sort of cook odd things with lot, lot odd things about them <clears throat> and it's about um, some stamps and postal history some ephemera to do with the city of nice which I know little about, so hopefully others will tell me more about it. And it starts with um, it starts with a stamp from Great Britain, which is the obvious place to start. And it's uh, <clears throat> a stamp I've always wanted to have for years because it's a coronation stamp from 1953, posted soon after the coronation. But I was only five at the time, and I was only allowed to have the twopence halfpenny and the fourpence, and my brother was allowed the one and three and the one and six. So I've always wanted to have one of these <clears throat> and I found it on a cover and then I was a bit, uh, I wondered who this chap was, his strange name, Marcus de Labis Trabbard, the Victorian order in the OBE and I found out that he was <clears throat> a resident of Nice, he was actually a doctor at the hospital in Nice, the Victoria Hospital, 
he had a villa there, and this is where the letter is addressed to. He was very keen on winter sports. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, he was the personal physician to the Duke of Connaught. <coughs> and the Duke of Connaught I came across because he was the chap who, when they rebuilt the uh, Promenade des Anglais in Nice in 1931, they asked the Duke of Connaught to open it, which struck me as a bit odd. Why would you ask uh, a son of Queen Victoria to open the Promenade des Anglais in 1931? So I thought I'd look a little bit more at Nice and I know little about it. <clears throat> and the more I looked at it, the more fascinating I found it. Uh, this is a 1902 souvenir postcard, uh, <clears throat> very much written for the English. And again, it shows La Promenade des Anglais. And it was first built, it was a sort of a muddy path until 1822. Uh, funded by an English expatriate community led by the Reverend Lewis Way. And what he persuaded the expats to do out there was to fund the beggars and the homeless to build the promenade. And then once they built a rather nice paved promenade going west, uh, the expats built very nice houses just on the other side of it. And I was struck by this fact that the beggars were used to, to ride it. And looking at the uh, the collection, I found I got these uh, rather nice chari charity stamps, the Red Cross stamps from 1959, beautiful engravings by Jacques Callot. And in common with many other cities, Nice had an enormous population of beggars and the unemployed. Nice had suffered particularly from the Napoleonic Wars in terms of demobilization and also by the failing harvests. So I put this up as a juxtaposition of here we have see, you know, Nice, the prosperous city with the grand palaces, but much of the infrastructure actually coming from people who are less fortunate. Some of you will have seen the picture on the right, a postcard. It's a favorite of many people showing the washing in the river Pion. But Nice struck me as a nice city of contrasts. On the left, we have the flower market. And I think a rather typical example of someone who's actually going to buy the flowers. But standing next to them, <clears throat> more typical of the people who lived in, these the people who actually served the markets and produced the flowers from the neighborhood. And on the right, we have the local people washing their um, clothes in the pile. We'll come across a washerwoman in a few minutes time. And <clears throat> I think that gives a very good example of being bought by the tourists at this time, showing the picturesque nature of Nice. It also shows how multicultural Nice was. It was not a typical West European city. So in a bookshop, I found an old map. This is printed in 1765. And it's the start of the Seven Year War, which is basically France against uh, <clears throat> England and allies and led to Quebec and all that. But the reason I put it up here is to remind me is how Mediterranean Nice is. It really is a traditional Mediterranean city. It's been Greek. It's been Roman, it's been Arab, it's been French, it's been Sardinian, it's been back to France, back to Siena, back to uh, <coughs> Italy. Mussolini was after it in 1942, and now finally in 1860 and someone has stayed in France. But very much a sea town. So since I like collecting stamps, I put some stamps up, which are French stamps, <laughs> a couple of Italian ones, to, to reflect the Mediterranean nature. I was struck by the, the choice of some of the ships. Um, the Falak is obvious, a typical coastal vessel. La Melapine, the, uh, the French ship there, it's a 44 frigate, uh, which is actually captured by the British. So it seemed a bit odd that the French would put up one of their ships captured by the British as a stamp. Until I found that that was the ship that was used to bring Napoleon's mother uh, from <clears throat> Italy and Corsica into Nice when he was still emperor. And similarly, on the right, we have La Boudouze, uh, which was a ship which again was captured by the British at Toulon in the Napoleonic Wars. But earlier in her career, she'd actually captured the British ship <coughs> over in America uh, during the Wars of Independence. So here you have a typical example of how ships can mean different things to different people when they look at them. I put the bottom left up the paddle steamer tug, the Italian uh, stamp. Uh, there isn't a French stamp that shows that sort of ship. Um, I like that because when you look at some of the sea time history of Nice, you find that 
rather like uh, cars in the 1930s and 40s, they're always breaking down. And in fact, the Italians made a fortune out of rescuing French ships that had broken down in the early days of steam and sail. Researching further, I came across some covers in an old box somewhere. And I liked the way that these seem to be on the, the postal routes for a lot of the coastal uh, mail. The one on the left has been taken from Marseille to Ancona via Nice, but it's gone by land with some interesting postmarks. And I was attracted by the fact that it starts out in Marseille in France, it goes to Nice and Sardinia, it goes to Antibes, it goes to Bologna, and it ends up in the Papal States, just reminding me as to how these frontiers are very flexible. And the cover on the right with the Via Marina stamp, I like because it indicates the coastal nature of much of the traffic. And I, put, I selected this one because of the E on that postmark, which indicated the carriage was not by a Sardinian ship and that the mail had to be very cautious about who was actually carrying whose mail, but it came by a steamboat. Uh, this brought me to the issue of Nice and to, to where it actually was on the map. And I've got two maps there on the bottom left and the bottom right. Uh, one is printed in 1840, one is printed in 1870. And they nicely show how Nice suddenly flipped from being in Sardinia and became part of France as a result of the deal that uh, Prince Cavour of Italy did with uh, Louis Napoleon III, uh, much to the horror of Garibaldi, who never forgave him. Uh, but fundamentally, as I understand it, <coughs> in, in uh, recognition of the emperor's support, of uh, Italian unification, he was granted the kingdom of Savoy, the county of Savoy in recompense. And so Nice came across and the map in the front shows it. And I put some of the stamps up to show that although the border may have bounced around, the coat of arms and the sort of recognition of Nice goes way back to 1430 when we first see the Red Eagles. So <clears throat> after, May, after Nice, which in the, I think the French phrase is reattachment, which comes across as reattachment in my translations, after Nice found itself reattached to Nice, um, <clears throat> the mail shows this. So the one on the left shows Marseille to Genoa by Nice, uh, but it's only a few days after the reattachment. So we find that we're still seeing the hand stamps from Sardinia. But once again, we see it being carried by a, a mail ship, the Fresnet line. Whereas the mail on the right, uh, 1878, totally within France as the postal rates indicate and the postmarks. But I like this one because it is from Agde, can't pronounce that properly, but Agde de Nice. And that uh, time was therefore from the entrance of the Canal de Midi, once again, reinforcing the coastal nature of Nice and the, the traffic that went between it. And then these two covers just to remind me that uh, once again, as it flipped, <coughs> that in 1864, we now have French stamps on the mail going across the Genoa, and we have Italian stamps on the mail coming back. And the various nice postmarks you get indicating the borders they crossed and the checks they go through. So to the city itself, <coughs> the itself comes from the same word as Nike comes from, the goddess of victory. Uh, but it's a, a city with great views, beautiful light, and quite famous for its art. So I put up some of the nice stamps that reflect uh, how attractive Nice is, starting with the uh, national costume in the top left. And we have the Bay of uh, Nice in the middle left. On the right, we have uh, the um, <clears throat> Place de Messina, uh, decked out as it frequently is with works of modern art, rather like our use of the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square. And then the middle right, we have the Promenade des Anglais going in the distance, but the, the famous Hotel Magresca, which we'll hear a bit more in the meeting. <clears throat> Across the bottom, I just put a few of the French stamps of the artists who are strongly associated with these. Uh, I sort of sneaked uh, Renoir in because he actually lived in cagnes sur mer for about 20 years, but I thought it was close enough. But what I liked about these is that they do show a very distinct sort of art that's associated with Nice and the, the various schools of painting, the colors, the design, the graphic, very much a modern city and a modern art. Going back to my love of postcards, <clears throat> pulled a couple out here. The one on the left shows Chateau Hill, Castle Hill in English, 1928. 
Um, you can still see the staircase going up by the round tower there, the Belanda Tower. These days visitors can go up in a nice uh, elevator, a lift, which was thoughtfully built by the Germans in the Second World War when they were busy building a submarine base underneath, which was never finished, thankfully. Um, the chateau itself, which used to be on the top, was raised to the ground by Louis XIV, who was fed up with capturing it and recapturing it as the border went backwards and forwards. Uh, but my favourite story to do with uh, the chateau was in one of the sieges, which was when the Austrians and Turks were actually besieging it. Um, <clears throat> the, the siege was turned by uh, a lady, a washerwoman, back to my third postcard. And uh, she was on the, uh, on the walls there. And a lady called Katerina Siguran uh, was attacked by a great big Turkish chap with a sword. So being a washerwoman, she hit him with her wooden paddle and knocked him out. <clears throat> the sort of paddle that uh, Zola talks about in Germanal. And having flattened him, she grabbed his flag, which he'd been carrying, and wiped her backside with it and waved it. And that so motivated everyone else, apparently, that they gave up and went off. It's partly apocryphal, partly true. But the waterfall on the right, which is still one of the main tourist attractions in Nice, is artificially built. It's built on the remains of the castle keep. And um, <clears throat> it's on the springs that the Greeks first used, a beautiful park. But that's actually the remains of the castle and people go up there for, to enjoy the views. Down the town itself, a couple of examples. Very much a royalty town. We'd had Queen Victoria and the Duke of Connaught but the Emperor Wilhelm I and II both came here, King Leopold came here, <coughs> and the Empress Eugenie used to like coming here. So the one on the left is the Palm Garden on the Avenue now, but the first. It's still there, obviously they replanted the palms, but it's now a popular location for concerts, and Edith Piaf, Iron Maiden, Sting, jazz musicians have all performed there, and it is still a mecca for artists to perform. The church on the right is the most beautiful church. It's a Greek Orthodox church, Russian Orthodox church, sorry. Beautifully embellished inside, and that's because it was funded by the Russians. It was opened by Tsar Nicholas II and dedicated to the Tsarevich, who was the crown prince who died in Nice in 1860. And <clears throat> the church is still part of the Patriarchy of Moscow. It is technically Russian soiled. It has the same full diplomatic status of the embassies. Um, and is very much regarded. I talked about the palaces on the Boulevard, Pal Boulevard de Longley. So every now and again you get these rather attractive envelopes with the publicity. I like the one on the left, this great hotel, which is now split into apartments. But if you go in there, you can still see the grand entrance from the tapestry walls. Uh, and this hotel also has the interesting fact that it was one of the ones that Thomas Cook picked up early on when they were first putting package tours together. So there's a lot of uh, English tourists flooded in as part of uh, Thomas Cook's revolution. The Hotel Westminster is still owned by the same family from when it opened in 1881. And that also is full of the most wonderful frescoes, gold leaf ironwork and paintings uh, by an artist called Bender. The seafront really developed, so I've shown the same seafront <clears throat> called Promenade de Midian on the left, and it's called Le Quai de Yateti on the right. And the Promenade de Midi was actually renamed in 1917 to honor the USA coming into the Triple Alliance in 1917. And it shows how, in that period uh, between the wars, it developed from being a rather pleasant esplanade into being a very fashionable esplanade in which one went out in one's best. Uh, motor traffic on the Esplanade and <clears throat> at this point we had a lot of fishermen who didn't go fishing very much but they stayed on the beach on the right in the right hand postcard because they made far more money being photographed by English tourists than actually going out to catch fish. <laughs> this is a, an envelope which shows that Nice regarded itself now as a tourist city. It was really attracting not just the royalty and the rich and so it's therefore quite interesting that it's the first flam, the first illustrated flam from those outside of Paris. Uh, this particular one, <clears throat> it was first introduced in October 24. 
and it's uh, carried on use until 1931. Another factor that really affected Nice was the opening up of the airport, which is about 10 kilometers to the west. And so here's a couple of philatelic covers. The first one celebrating the Paris-Nice uh, route in 1938, closely followed in 1939 by the Nice de Marseille to New York route, which then got disrupted by the war, of course. But Nice was really opening up as an international one. Now the war had a big impact on Nice, mainly because of the American influence. From 1948, it started hosting spring musical festivals. Initially, these were the highlighting the French chansonnier, the tradition of people actually singing songs, which we have no exact translation for in English, really, because they're songs which are poetry, they're songs of the soul, they're closest to the songs of Leonard Cohen or Bob Dylan in the modern idiom than what we regard as pop songs. And the stamps I selected from the ones which we have available to us, I picked out singers who have a particular association with Nice itself. <clears throat> they all either sing in concerts or they actually busked in the hotels. Claude Francois, for example, who was actually of Egyptian parentage, he earned his living for about six years going along those various hotels on the seafront before he became famous. Another factor to do with some of these people is their connection to the French resistance. Bettina Rossi, who actually bridged between um, opera and what we would call chanson, uh, he was actually arrested by the Gestapo, but eventually released and apologized because they improved, couldn't prove anything, but he'd actually lent his motor car to be used by the resistance to ferry people around. And Chevalier, who had a mixed reputation after the war because he was prosecuted by the French, but exonerated, uh, but not wholly believed elsewhere in the world. He'd been imprisoned in the First World War. He was captured by the Germans. And in the Second World War, he actually went and sang in the prisoner of war camps and uh, <clears throat> supported the resistance in that way. So there was an association of the, the chansonniers, the songs of France, busking along in those great hotels and a connection to the resistance. And after the Second World War, <clears throat> Paris, which had been the center of jazz, to a great extent, a lot of the musicians moved to ask the Nice. They went to Paris to make the money and they came to Nice to play the music, was how Miles Davis described it. And so I put up some of the musicians who all again either had concerts in Nice or came and busked in Nice. And here again, we get the connection with the resistance. Uh, Josephine Baker <coughs> was a famous resistance fighter. In fact, she got the Croix de Guerre after the war from uh, General de Gaulle. Uh, she used to go using her diplomatic status. Uh, she used to go and busk around the various prisoner of war camps and use those to actually take photographs of all the people in the prisoner of war camps. And these photographs were then smuggled back in to make the false documents for people escaping. Uh, Miles Davis was probably more famous for his relationship with Julia Greco, who was sadly there's no stamp of her yet. And Boris Vian was also associated. Django Ria, sorry, Jan, Django Reinhold came down to Nice because as a Romanian and a jazz musician, his life was in danger in Paris. But the tradition of jazz is very strong in Nice and it is still somewhere where all jazz musicians hope to be invited to the main festival and hope to give a concert. Um, the American connection, because I started with it being an English city, it is a French city, but there's a strong USA connection because of that. I put a couple of mail up from the sense of covers from the first and the second world war. And then to end with, <clears throat> I noticed that Nice was obviously quite popular with stamp collectors. I can't think why they'd want to go to Nice to look at stamps, but they did. And these are some of the philatelic items from 1931, 1935, 1937. And obviously <clears throat> it was very well thought. I've managed to find a few of the programs of the exhibitions and a lot of very famous collectors regarded Nice as an important place to go. And then they started again after the war. So I put up two of the more recent ones. <coughs> and the, the one on the left is showing how soon it got started, 1947. Uh, the one on the right showing Chapelle Saint-Pont. I like that because it's been signed by the artist. 
it says uh, by uh, F.E. de A. But actually, he was a Frenchman called Francis, Francis Dujardin, who guarded his privacy very closely. So he never signed his picture in his own name. And he's very famous for the paintings he did all along of Nice. He did some of the great posters in the 1930s. And if you think of the title of scenes to Poirot on the BBC television with the Coronation class locomotives and the sleep cars, De A did those sort of scenes publicizing Nice. But I wanted to end with those two philatelic things because it just struck me that if after World War II we can get back to philatelic exhibitions, hopefully after COVID we can get back to them as well. So a little chip around these. Thank you very, very much, Roger. That's very, very interesting that. If you could just... Where do I go? Up the top? Yeah, up the top there should be a little red box. That's it. That's it. Thank you very much. Yes, I enjoyed that. I did like the car, which had a, it had a 20 hour trip to um, from Paris to Nice. <laughs> I think these days with TGV, you can do it slightly more quickly. 20 hours, my goodness, <laughs> over a day and a half. Has anybody got any questions? Everybody seen all they want to, and it was very good, it was interesting that. It was. Nice and postcards. Okay, it's Christopher, got... Chris, this is Ed Grabowski in the States. I, I just have a, a, a question for Roger uh, yes. uh, from, from the point of view of my collection, not his. And I was wondering if he ever heard of a resident of Nice from approximately 1920 to 1950 named E. Virgil Neal, who owned the Tokalon Cosmetics Company. Uh, I am I am desperately looking for a cover to Mr. Neal uh, uh, while he resided in Nice in conjunction with some studies I'm doing in philately and international mail order fraud. He was a fraudster in the United States and he became a, a, a big entrepreneur in, in France. And in fact, his portrait hangs in one of the hospitals uh, because he's, he was instrumental in getting that hospital built. So if you ever see any mail to E. Virgil Neal, I would be interested in seeing that. I, I will take a look. If it was in cosmetics, he may well have had some mail going to and from grass, which is probably where the main cosmetics were at that time. Uh, I'm not sure. The, a lot of the mail for cosmetics goes to Paris. Yeah, but grass is probably where many of the materials came from at that time. Mm -hmm. That was the main growing area. I'll take a look. Okay, thank you. Mm, always possible. Okay then. All right. No more questions. Then I'll give the last display. So let me just share my screen. A very very simple look at French airmail stamps. Um, the 1929 UPU Congress in London largely regularised international airmail rates. Um, in 1932, there we are, I can't have this off now. Uh, the European rate to any destination in Europe was a 75 centime supplement on top of the foreign post postage rate. And the Blériot stamp of 1934, 225, is the first one, I think, which combines the postage and the airmail supplement. The inland supplement for inland airmail was 35 centimes, um, which made a combined rate of 85 centimes. But there's no 85 centimes stamp until 1936. Just to move away from airmail stamps for a second, um, Air Blur began in a very big way in 1935 to. Uh, organize a lot of flights to destinations in France. But it's very, very expensive, two francs 50, the basic supplement on top of the postage. And although you see a lot of souvenir car envelopes from Air Blur, commercial Air Blur is very difficult to find, but that's a nice one there. Second weight step you see, and it costs five francs 50. And coming into Paris, it's used the pneumatic system for speed when it's arrived. 
Now the first AML stamps are this little set in 1936 and they did manage to begin with to fit the var most of the values to um, various areas to which they were going. Again, back to the 225 rate for Europe, one to the Czech Republic and one to London. But most of them come in combination with other ones, with other stamps. Um, Indochina there. And bear in mind that the postage to French colonies, of course, is inland postage, not foreign postage. Um, can confuse people sometimes. A second weight step there to Dahomey in 1937 with the free franc 50 on it. And people didn't always get the rates right. And I'm pretty sure that one of the top there is, is uh, simply overpaid. It's um, registered to Switzerland with a pair mm. of 25s, but it's, it just doesn't quite work out. And it's just slightly overpaid. And the foreign post, the problem with trying to produce stamps combining the postage and the airmail rates is when rates change, it throws the whole thing out. It doesn't work anymore. Fortunately, when the postage rates went up in 1937, the 250 can now be used for Europe instead of 225. That was a bit of luck, really. And that really was the last of time they tried to produce stamps which combined the airmail rate and the, or the airmail supplement and the postage rate. And the next set, we jumped until well after the war, or just after the war in 1946 with this set with the mythological characters. And this time they've just gone for big high values, um, which can be used in combination to make up various, whatever you might require. The 40 franc is it in all sorts of combinations. It's worth, I mean, these are two quite nice covers. The top one there to Indochina, and it's bang on the rate, right, 146 francs. It, it works out exactly. And the one below it, United States, and again, post-war, the rates were changing very rapidly, so people had to keep in touch. If you look at the bottom one, it's registered, but they haven't got any registration labels. They were short of paper at the end of the war, so the registration is just manuscript. A couple more there, 48 francs to Bolivia, 65 francs to Madagascar. <coughs> The 50 franc, which I think is the goddess Aris. And again, now these both to the United States, they're slightly, they're not quite right, the postage. Well, the top one is overpaid by one franc, but one franc's nothing, isn't it? So just convenience, isn't it? They pay 62 franc, they could have gone away with 61. And the one below it should have been 75, uh, 71, and they pay 75. And the highest value is the 200 franc, the Sun King and his chariot. And there were special airmail rates for printed matter. And I worked it out at the bottom. It doesn't quite work, I know, because the, the dates don't quite fit, but I can't calculate it any other way. If anybody's got any other suggestions, good luck. But uh, it's 624 francs with three of the 200s. Hold on, it's just coming back. Right. And of course, they had quite a number of commemorators were also produced for you know, classified as airmail stamps. There's a rather attractive 100 franc for the CITT conference. But the top letter is nothing to do with airmail at all. It's, it's simply a heavy registered insured letter. And the 100 francs, it's very nicely to make up the 105 franc postage. The bottom one is an airmail letter, again, the right rate, 120 francs to the Belgian Congo. And then in 1950, we come to these stamps, I think they're rather attractive, these town stamps. 100 franc Lille, 122 francs, the top one, that's exactly right. The bottom one to Indochina. 200 franc, the Bordeaux, and the last cover with the two top values, I've got pleased to get this 300 franc and 500 franc. 
and it comes to 846 francs. It's even got a one franc arm stamp on there, and it works out. I've got it on the bottom there. You can work it. It does work out absolutely to the franc. The <laughs> 10 sardine postage due in America is cost, and it's not postage due. So it was paid exactly correctly, 846 francs, which is for 150 to 155 grams. That's quite up to go. I've got a lot of dog count, quite emotionally. Quite pleased with it. There we are. That is a little brief look at French air mouse stamps. Very good. Very nice. Thank you, Chris. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. I don't go for big air mouse stamps, but little ones I can afford them. <laughs> right. Has anybody got anything else they wish to add? I might stop recording just now. Oh.